Hi everyone, it's Miss Morogi here. I miss each and every one of you. I cannot wait for you to come back into the building. But in the meantime, I'm going to read to you every night. I hope you enjoy the stories that I share with you. This, my goal is to keep your learning engaged and keep your imagination running high with every story that I share with you. So today I'm going to start off with Maniac Mickey by Jerry Spinelli. Before the story. They say Maniac McGee was born in a dump. They say his stomach was a cereal box and his heart a soft spring. They say he kept an eight inch cockroach on a leash and that rat stood guard over him while he slept. They say if you knew he was coming in, you sprinkled salt on the ground and he ran over it. Within two or three blocks, he would be as slow as anyone else, they say. What's true, what's myth, it's hard to know. Finnish world's gone now. Yet even today, you'll never find a kid sitting on the steps where he once lived. The Little League field is still there in the band shell. Cobbler's Corner still stands at the corner of Hector and Birch. And if you ask the man behind the counter, he'll take the clump of string out of the drawer and let you see it. Gray school girls in two mills still jump rope and chant, maniac, maniac, he's so cool. Maniac, maniac, don't go to school. Runs all night, runs all right. Maniac, maniac, kissed a bull. And sometimes the girl holding one end of the rope is from the west side of Hector and the girl on the other end is from the east side. And if you're looking for Maniac McGee's legacy or monument, that's as good as any, even if it wasn't really a bull. But that's okay, because the history of a kid is one part fact, two part legacy, and three parts snowball. And if you want to know what it was like back when Maniac McGee rolled these parts, well, just run your hand under your movie seat and be very, very careful not to let the facts get mixed up with the truth. Now, that section is a great foreshadowing to the book and how Maniac McGee earned his legacy and some of the things that he went through. So let's quickly review that skill of foreshadowing. So foreshadowing is when an author hints or mentions what's about to happen. Now let's break down that vocabulary word just a little further. So for in the word foreshadowing is a prefix that means ahead or before. And shadow is a glimpse of something without full detail. So that gives us foreshadowing. And the section that I just read to you is a good foreshadowing of the whole story and how Maniac McGee became Maniac McGee. Today I'm going to read to you chapters 1 to 5, and these are some of the vocabulary words in chapters 1 to 5. The first one is Maniac. And Maniac is a crazy person. The next thing is Legacy. And legacy is inheritance or what is left to a person. The next word is trolley. And a trolley is a car that runs electronically from overhead poles. The next word is trussle. And trussle is support made of a horizontal bar with four legs. Next we have grungy. And when something is grungy, it's dirty or unkept. Our next word is commotion, and commotion is confusion, noise, or trouble. And finally, we have the word hoist, and to hoist is to lift up. So those are our vocabulary words that I want you to listen out for as I read. Chapter 1. Maniac McGee was not born in a dump. He was born in a house, a pretty ordinary house, right across the river from here in Bridgeport. 
and he had regular parents, a mother and a father. But not for long. One day his parents left him with a sitter and took the PNW high speed trolley into the city. On their way back home, they were on board when the PNW had its famous crash. When the motorman was drunk and took the high trussle over the Sky Hill River at 60 miles an hour. And the whole cadoodle took a swan dive into the water. And just like that, Maniac was an orphan. He was three years old. Of course, to be accurate, he wasn't really Maniac then. He was Jeffrey, Jeffrey Lionel McGee. Little Jeffrey was shipped off to his nearest relatives, Aunt Dot and Uncle Dan. They lived in Hollinsburg in the western part of Pennsylvania. Aunt Dot and Uncle Dan hated each other, but because they were strict Catholics, they wouldn't get a divorce. Around the time Jeffrey arrived, they stopped talking to each other. Then they stopped sharing. Pretty soon they were two of everything in the house. Two, two bathrooms, two TVs, two refrigerators, two toasters. If it were possible, they would have had two Jeffreys. As it was, they split him up as best as they could. For instance, he would eat dinner with Aunt Dot on Monday, with Uncle Dan on Tuesday, and so on. Eight years of that. Then they came the night of the spring musical at Jeffrey's school. He was in the chorus. There was only one show in one auditorium, and so Aunt Dot and Uncle Dan were forced to share at least that much. Aunt Dad sat on one side, Uncle Dan on the other. Jeffrey probably started screaming from the start of the song, which was talk to the animals, but nobody knew it because he was drowned out by all the other no noises, all the other noise. Then the music ended. Jeffrey went right on screaming, his face bright red by now, his ne neck bulging. The music director faced the singers frozen with his arms still raised. In the audience, faces began to change. There was a quick smatter of giggling by some people who figured the screaming kid was some part of the show, some funny animal maybe. Then the giggling stopped and eyes started to shift and heads started to turn because now everybody could see that this wasn't part of the show at all. That little Jeffrey McGee wasn't supposed to be up there on the risers, pointing to his aunt and uncle, blowing out from the midst of the chorus, talk, talk, will ya? Talk, talk, talk. No one knew it then, but it was the birth scream of a legend. And that's when the running started. Three springy steps down from the risers. Girls in pastel dresses screaming. The music director lunging. A leap from the stage, out the door, out the side door, and into the starry, sweet onion grass smelling night. Never again to return to the house of two toasters. Never again to return to school. Chapter two. Everybody knows that maniac McGee, then Jeffrey, started out in Hollinsburg and wound up in two mills. The question is, what took him so long? And what did he do along the way? Sure, 200 miles is a long way, especially on foot. But the year that it took him to cover it was about 51 weeks more than he needed figuring the way he could run even then. The legend doesn't have the answer. That's why this period is known as the lost year. And another question, why did he stay there? Why two mills? Of course, there is the obvious answer that sitting right across the Shy Hill is Bridgeport where he was born. Yet there are other theories 
Some say he just got tired of running. Some say it was the butterscotch crim crimbits. And some say he only intended to pause here, but that he stayed because he was so happy to make a friend. If you listen to everybody who claims to have seen Jeffrey Maniac McGee that first day, there must have been 10,000 people in a parade of fire trucks waiting for him at the town's limits. Don't believe it. A couple of people truly remember. And here's what they saw. A straggly little kid jogging towards them, the soles of both sneakers hanging by their hinges and flopping open like dog tongues each time they came up from the pavement. But it was something they heard that made him stick in their minds all these years. As he paused, as he passed them, he said, hi, just that, hi, and he was gone. They stopped, they blinked, they churned, they stared after him. They wondered, do I know that kid? Because people just didn't say that to strangers out of the blue. The figurative language in this book is amazing. I just wanna stop and explain it. It's just really great. Chapter three, as for the first person to actually stop and talk with Maniac, that would be Amanda Beale. And it happened because of a mistake. It was around eight in the morning and Amanda was heading for grade school, like hundreds of other kids all over town. What made Amanda different was that she was carrying a suitcase and that's what caught Maniac's eyes. He figured she was like him, running away, so he stopped and said, hi. Amanda was suspicious. Who was this white stranger kid? And what was he doing in the East End where almost all the other kids were black? And why was he saying that? But Amanda Bill was also friendly. So she stopped and said, hi, back. Are you running away? Jeffrey asked her. Huh? Said Amanda. Jeffrey pointed at the suitcase. Amanda frowned, then thought, then laughed. She laughed so hard, she began to lose her balance. So she set the suitcase down and sat on it so she could laugh more safely. When at last she could speak, she said, I'm not running away. I'm going to school. She saw the puzzlement on his face. She got off the suitcase and opened it up right there on the sidewalk. Just Jeffrey gasped. Books? Books, all right. Book sides of the suitcase crammed with them. Both sides of the suitcase crammed with them. Dozens more than anyone could ever need for homework. Jeffrey fell to his knees. He and Amanda in the suitcase were like a rock in a stream. The schoolgoers just flood to the left and right around them. He turned his head this way and that to read the titles. He lifted the books on top to see the ones beneath. There were fiction books and nonfiction books. Who did it books and let's be friends books and what is it books and how to books and how not to books and just regular books. On the bottom was a single volume from an encyclopedia. It was the letter A. My library, Amanda Beal said proudly. Somebody called. Going to be late for school, girl. Amanda looked up. The street was almost deserted. She slammed the suitcase shut and started hauling it along. Jeffrey took the suitcase from her. I'll carry it for you. Amanda's eyes shot wide. She hesitated. Then she snatched it back. Who are you? She said, Jeffrey McGee. 
Where are you from? West End? No. She stared at him at the flap sole sneakers. Back in those days, the town was pretty much divided. The East End was black. The West End was, was white. I know you're not from the East End. I'm from Bridgeport. Bridgeport? Over there? That Bridgeport? Yep. Well, why aren't you there? It's where I'm from, not where I am. Great. So where do you live? Jeffrey looked around. I don't know. Maybe here? Maybe, Amanda shook her head and chuckled. Maybe you better go ask your mother and father if you live here or not. She speeded up. Jeffrey dropped back for a second, then caught up with her. Why are you talk taking all these books to school? Amanda told him. She told him about her little brother and sister at home who loved to crayon every piece of paper they could find, whether or not it already had it had already whether or not it already had type all over it. And about the dog, Bow Wow, who chewed everything he could get his teeth on. And that, she said, was why she carried her whole library to and from school every day. First bell was ringing. The school was still a block away. Amanda, Amanda ran. Jeffrey ran. Can I have a book? He said. They're mine, she said. Just to read. To borrow? No. Please, what's your name? Amanda. Please, Amanda. Anyone. Your shortest one. I'm late now, and I'm not going to stop and open up this thing again. Forget it. He stopped. Amanda. He kept running, then stopped, turned, glared. What kind of kid was this, anyway? All grungy, ripped shirt. Why didn't he go back to Bridgeport or the West End, where he belonged? Bother some white girl with up there. And why was she still standing here? So what if I loan you one, huh? How am I going to get it back? I'll bring it back, honest. If it's the last thing I do. What's your address? 728 Sycamore. But you can't come there. You can't even be here. Second bell rang. Amanda screamed. World ran. Amanda? She stopped, churned. Oh, she sneaked, squeaked. She tore a book from the suitcase, hurled it at him here and dashed into school. The book came flapping like a wounded duck and fell at Jeffrey's feet. It was a story of the children's crusade. Jeffrey picked it up and Amanda Beale was late to school for the only time in her life. Chapter four. Jeffrey made three other appearances that first day. The first came at one of the high school fields during eighth grade gym class. Most of the students were playing soccer, but about a dozen were playing football because they were on the varsity and the gym teacher happened to be the football coach. The star quarterback, Brian Dennehy, wound up and threw a 60 yarder to his favorite receiver, James Hands Down, who was streaking a fly pattern down the sideline. But the ball never quite reached Hands. Just as he was about to cradle it in his big brown loving mitts, it vanished. By the time he recovered from the shock, a little kid was weaving upfield through the varsity football players. Nobody laid a paw on him. When the kid got down to the soccer field, he turned and punted the ball. It sailed back over the up-looking gym classers, spiraling more perfectly than anything Brian Dennehy had ever thrown. 
and landed in the outstretched hands of still stunned hands down. Then the kid ran off. There was one other thing, something that all of them saw when no one believed until they compared notes after school that day. Up until the punt, the kid had done everything with one hand. He had to because his other hand was a book. He had to because in his other hand was a book. Chapter five. Later on that first day, there was a commotion in the West End. At 803 Oriel Street, to be exact, at the backyard of 803 Oriel, to be exact here, think, of course, was the infamous address of Finneswald. Kids strayed away from Finneswald, the way old people stayed away from Saturday afternoon matinees at a $2 movie. And what would happen to a kid who didn't stay away? That was a question best left unanswered. To say that occasionally, even today, if some poor raggedy stained wretch is seen shuffling through town, word will spread that this once was a bright, happy, normal child who had the misfortune of blending onto Finswald's property. That's why, if you valued your life, you never chased a ball into Finneswald's backyard. Finneswald's backyard was a graveyard of tennis balls and baseballs and footballs and frisbees and model airplanes and one-way boomerangs. That's why his front steps were the only unset on front steps in town and why no paper kid would ever deliver there and why no kid on a snow day would ever shovel that sidewalk, not for a zillion dollars. So it was late afternoon and screams were coming from finister walls. Who, what, why? The screamer was a boy whose name is lost to us for after this day, he disappeared from the pages of history. We believe he was about 10 years old. Let's call him Arnold Jones. Arnold Jones was being hoisted in the air above Finisterwald's backyard fence. The hoisters were three or four high school kids. There was one of the things, this was one of the things they did for fun. Arnold Jones had apparently forgotten one of the cardinal rules of survival in the West End. Never let yourself be near Finisterwalds and high school kids at the same time. So here's Arnold J Jones held up by all these hands, flopping and kicking and streaking like some poor asset human sacrifice about to be tossed off a pyramid. No, no, please, he pleads, please. So of course they do it. The high schoolers dump him into the yard and now they back off, no longer laughing, just watching. Watching the back door of the house, the windows, the dark green shades. As for Arnold Jones, he clams up the instant he hits the ground. He's on his knees now, all hunched and puckered. His eyes goggled at the back door, at the doorknob. He's paralyzed. A mouse in front of the yawning maw of a python. Now, after a minute or two of breathless silence, one of the high schoolers thinks he hears something. He whispers, listen. Another one hears it a faint, tiny noise, a rattling, a chittering, a chattering, and getting louder, yes, chattering teeth, Arnold Jones' teeth. They're chattering like snare drums. And now, as if his mouth isn't big enough to hold the chatter, 
the rest of his body joins in. First, it's a buzzing like trembling, then the shakes, and finally, it's as if every bone inside him is clamoring to get out. A high schooler squeaks. He's got the finister wallies. Yeah, yeah, they yell. And they stand there cheering and clapping. Years later, the high schoolers account differ. One says the kid from nowhere hopped the fence, hopped it without ever laying a hand on it to boost himself over. Another says the kid just opened the back gate and scrolled on in. Another swears it was a mirage, some sort of hallucination, possibly caused by evil emancipation surrounding 803 Oriole Street. Real or not, they all say they saw the same kid. Not much bigger than Arnold Jones, raggedy, flap-soled sneakers, book in one hand. They saw him walk right up to Arnold, Arnold, and they saw Arnold look up at him, faint away. Just a bad case of the finister wallies. Did Arnold have that his body kept shaking for half a minute after he honked out. The phantom Sumerian stuck the book between his teeth, crouched down, hoisted Arnold Jones's limp, caressed over his shoulder and hauled him out of there like a sack of flour. Unfortunately, he chose to put Arnold down at the one spot in town as bad as Finister Wall's backyard, namely. Finister Wall's front steps. When Arnold came to and discovered this, he took off like a horsefly from a sweater, from a swatter. As the Stupfield high schooler, high schoolers were leaving the scene, they looked back. They saw the kid, cool times 10, stretch out on the forbidden steps and open his book to read. So those were some really interesting chapters that we just read and kind of gave us a good idea of who Maniac McGee is. Um, he is clearly the protagonist in the story so I really hope that you enjoyed what we've read so far. I'm excited to know what else happened to Maniac McGee to have him um, get his reputation, to earn his reputation. I hope you were able to hear some of the vocabulary words that I reviewed with you earlier. Hope you heard them as I read to you chapters one to five. And more importantly, I hope you enjoyed the reading. So, uh, I will see you again tomorrow for more chapters from Maniac McGee. But for now, I hope you have a wonderful night. Bye-bye.